I promise not to make this talk too technical, so don't worry. A friend of mine once asked me, what's the closest thing to my heart? Well, for some of you, it might be money, it might be fame, but for me, it is my home. I come from Sarawak, a, a state that's blessed with nice greeneries. But unfortunately, the rise of industrialization, modernization, brought pollution along with it. Do you know that 80% of people who are exposed to pollution are actually living in urban areas? That's like you and me. And in fact, every day, 2 million tons of sewage and waste are being dumped into the world's water. That is the weight of all the humans in the world. Now, unless this guy su successfully bring all of us to Mars, Earth is the only home that we have. So today, I will be giving a short talk on how a tiny solution could save the planet. Well, when you talk about saving the planet, people will think about superhero or something like this. <laughs> so, um, well, that's what I hope to be, but real life tends to be a bit different. This is how I look like every day. Um, I work with the Southampton Nano Fabrication Center. So, a lot of my family members used to ask me, like, boy, you work with nanotechnology, what do you do? So, this is what I tell them. Every day, I go to lab. Uh, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm like a baker, actually. So we call this thing a wafer, right? In order to grow nanofilms, we bring this, we put it into a certain uh, equipment, set the temperature, set the pressure, and then close it, and we wait. Sometimes I even play phones, but anyway, <laughs> I specialize in using carbon-based nanomaterials for environmental sensing. This means that I use carbon nanodots, nanocrystalline graphene, and nanocrystalline graphite for uh, environmental sensing. I'll come down to that um, in more details later on. But before this, do any one of you actually know what is nanotechnology? No? I'll take a look at this, uh, these things. Which one do you think actually incorporates nanotechnology? <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, there, they use various degrees of nanotechnology, but I can tell you one thing. This thing here definitely do not have nanotechnology. And things like this, if you see, nano bioenergy card that's supposed to make you healthier by having it in your wallet is definitely not nanotechnology, okay? It's a scam. <laughs> so what is nanotechnology? Nanotechnology involves the manipulation of materials on a scale of 10 to the power of negative 9. Well, that's, if that's too technical, let me put it into perspective. Now, if I am 1 nanometers tall, okay, then the width of your hair, the thickness of your hair, would be equivalent to going from Edu City all the way to Mount Austin, that's where I stay, and back, oh, back here to Edu City again. Imagine walking that distance by foot. That is the scale we're talking about. So nanotechnology involves manipulation of material from, say, 10, 20 nanometers all the way to uh, submicron. That's about 100 nanometers across. One of the most common use of nanotechnology is often the ones that uh, we overlook, this thing. This is a 14 nanometer die that is found in your processor, your Intel processor. Now you notice that the section here looks quite bright in color. It looks like uh, it's made of rainbow, right? Do you know why? No? Okay, let me tell you this. If you were to buy the best optical microscope and try to look at this transistor with your eye, you will not be able to see it. The problem is not with your eye, no, it's not with the lens, you can buy a good lens, but the problem comes with light. Now, in the range of electromagnetic spectrum, light's wavelength is from 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers, alright? So, 
This means that with light, you can only see things as small as 200 nanometers because that's half the wavelength of the visible light. So in order to see things that are smaller than the wavelength of light, what can we do? We use electron microscope. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we use electrons to see. This thing is a scanning electron microscope, and what it does is it throws electron at the sample one by one, and then it detects the way the electrons scatter. That way, we can get some gorgeous pictures, like this ones you see here. The one you see here. And my personal favorite, Pikachu. <laughs> okay, now you might be thinking, okay, you can see this Pikachu, but how do you make it? How do you make a Pikachu so small that you cannot see it with your eyes? Any idea? Well, it turns out it's not that complicated. Just like building anything, there's two ways. Either you can build it brick by brick, layer by layer, like a 3D printer. You grow the material. Or you can remove the material that you don't want, so that only the material you want is been left behind. So to do this, we use plasmas. We use ion beams. If you don't understand that, imagine it's kind of like using a lightsaber to cut away materials that you don't want. Right, so why do we do that? You know, is there a specific um, purpose? It turns out, just by changing the microstructure, you get a lot of different effects. For example, if you look into nature, into a peacock's feather, the color doesn't come from the chemicals, but instead, it's from the structure of the feather itself. Now, back to the uh, transistors just now. You can't see it with your eyes, but the repeating structure of the transistor actually make a rainbow-like structure, rainbow-like color that's very, very beautiful. Now, I actually did something really interesting as well in order to get likes on uh, Instagram. So, guess what I made this rainbow with? I actually make this with graphite, which is usually black. But by changing the structure, you can make it into rainbow color. Now, Jeremy did mention uh, I did some research on quantum dots before. So what are quantum dots? This is quantum dots. So in a quantum dot system, you have a small particle. You excite it with UV light. It gets excited, goes back down. It emits a fluorescent. Okay? And this fluorescent could be different color, as you can see here. Now, what's so interesting about this is that you can generate all these different colors using exactly the same material. You do not need to change the chemical composition. Okay? You just need to change the size of the particle. So if you have a big particle, imagine it's an elephant that gets excited. You put this elephant in the pool, this elephant shakes. You get really long wavelength. That's like red light. If you throw a mouse into the same swimming pool, the mouse is excited. It generates a shorter wavelength because it's smaller. So the particle generates blue light. So how does this save the world? Well, it generates light. It's interesting. So it turns out we actually use carbon to create quantum dots that could sense specific heavy metal ions in water. Now what happens is when there's a specific ions of a specific size present in the liquid environment and if you excite these quantum dots, it transfers its energy and it releases less fluorescent. This means that we could use this to create optical fiber based sensor that can be used to monitor the, uh, the heavy metal ion concentration in water. This was a project that I did back when I was studying in uh, Swinburne University uh, with my supervisors. We created an app. We use optical fiber to uh, isolate the electronics. And then we even use uh, voice control. So actually, we have, we've uh, created this project. We've won numerous awards. Back, this was back in the undergraduate days. Uh, a lot of you would have reached this state in two more years. Is this the end? Is the degree the end of your studies? No, for me, I allow my uh, curiosity to go even further. So I joined University of Southampton two years ago to uh, tackle this project where we used nanocrystalline graphene, graphite, 
as a gas sensor. Now, the theory behind this is simple. So in a nanocrystalline system, you do not have a straight crystal. Instead, you have islands of crystal which are very conductive. So in a very conductive system, you have electrons trying to go over. But they do not have enough energy to go over. Now, when an oxidizing gas, for example, NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which is one of the uh, pollutants in the air, is absorbed onto this crystal, they provide a bridge. So this electron can now jump over this bridge and get over to meet their girlfriend. <laughs> so this is pretty much how we, how we use this material as an environmental sensor. Now this is a picture of the project that I did. And this is the setup that we use to, um, to test out the sensor. Now, all of you might be wondering, why? Why, why do I do this? You know? Why create a, a, a new sensor? There are sensors out there in the market, but most of them, they require heating in order to work. And to heat up, you need power. The idea is that by using this material, which could sense at room temperature, we could create sensors that are way smaller than what we have now. And one day, it could even be integrated into your fitness tracker, your phone, or your everyday IT devices. Now, it is predicted that every month, 328 million new things are being connected to the internet. And by 2030, 500 billion new things would be in the cloud. By connecting all our sensor to the internet, we can get an unprecedented amount of data, which can, which can give us new insight to the world around us. Now, the main aim is awareness. A research has been done by a research group in the United States on how people are aware of pollution. So they asked them, how serious do you think pollution is in the world? Most of the respondents said, yeah, we agree, it, air pollution is serious. Oh, it's going to kill everyone else. We need to uh, take, care of, take care of this. Air pollution is real. Global warming is real. But they asked the same question again to the respondents, how severe do you think air pollution is in your own area? Guess what? Everyone said, oh, no, we're fine. Our area is not that polluted. It's just some other areas that's polluted. There are some other countries that's polluted. We're fine. So people are in denial. The data are there. It shows that deforestation is happening. Air pollution is happening. But they just deny that all this have an effect on their immediate vicinity. So if we were to be able to make sensors that fit into everyone's everyday life and show them once and for all how pollution can affect them in their immediate vicinity, I think everyone would want to save themselves. So. It's a small idea. We use a small piece of technology to try and save the planet. Although I'm small, although I'm just alone, but for me, I'm just contributing my tiny part in our mission to save the world. Thank you.